of the paradigm and the phenomenon to which it serves as, as an example have in common is not substance, it's not a, a kind of common material element. What they have in common, according to Goldsmith, is just a relationship. It, it is itself a relationship. And it is this relationship that we have to grasp. Eh? Which kind of relationship? And between what? Goldsmith shows that in the paradigm, the generality or the idea does not result as a logic consequence by means of induction from the exhaustive enumeration of the individual cases, of course. Uh, rather, it is produced by the comparison of one only paradigm, one only singular example, with the object or class that the paradigm will, have, will make intelligible. This means that the paradigm, the paradigmatic relation, doesn't um, occur between a plurality of similar objects or between a singular object and the general principle or law which is exterior to it. The, para the paradigm is not already given, but the singularity becomes a paradigm. Eh? Plato says, paradigma gignetai, it becomes a paradigm by being shown beside or in just that position to the others. Thus, the paradigmatic relationship takes place between a single object, a single phenomenon, and what? And its intelligibility. The paradigm is a singularity considered in the medium of its knowability. And what makes something intelligible is the paradigmatic exhibition of its own knowability. Do you remember Aristotle saying that the, 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 the example is more knowable? So, the relationship that uh, an example and the object have in common is, in this way, this, the exhibition of this knowability. Let me, let's make an example. Eh? Let's consider the simplest case uh, the grammatical paradigm. And you know that in grammar, grammar is built by means of paradigm. Eh? You have no grammar if you don't have paradigm. Eh? You say like that. So let's take, um, for instance, the Latin term rosa, rose. So the Latin term rosa, rose, rosa, etc., etc., uh, by means of its paradigmatical exhibition, so as a paradigm, as an example, is suspended from its immediate denotative character. And in this way, it makes possible the constitution and the intelligibility of a more general set, uh, the set feminine noun of the first declination, of which it is both member and paradigm. So Rosa is a feminine term of the first declination and acts as a paradigm for the intelligibility of the set. It's a very important point to observe this neutralization of reference, eh, which defines the example. So if, if, for instance, I have to give an example for a performative, for a speech act, eh, so I will utter the syntax I swear, which is an example of a performative. But if I utter for, in order to give an example, eh, this uh, syntax, I swear, then the syntax cannot be understood as in a normal context, no? as, a, oh, as an oath, and yet must be treated as a real utterance in order for it to be taken as an example. Eh? Mark the paradoxical status of the example. Eh? What the example shows is its belonging to a class, but for this very reason, the example steps out of this class in the very moment in which it exhibits and defines it. So showing its belonging to a class, it steps out of it, it's excluded from it. 
So if you ask now, you can ask now, uh, does the rule apply to, to the example? It's very difficult to answer. Huh? Uh, the, the, really, the answer is not easy, since the rule applies to the example only as a normal case, and not as an example. So in a way, the example is excluded from the normal case, not because it does not belong to it, but on the contrary, because it exhibits its own belonging to it. We have here, in a way, the, the reverse case of the exception. So if we define the exception as an inclusive exclusion, something is included by means of its exclusion, the example instead functions as an exclusive inclusion. Something is excluded by means of its very inclusion. So we have now at least three, uh, I don't know if we, 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 we will be able to define an example, but we have now from this uh, uh, short analysis three characters uh, which define exemplarity. Uh, first, you remember Aristotle, the example moves from a singularity towards a singularity. Second, the example is more knowable. Third, the exemplary or paradigmatical relationship takes place between a phenomenon and its own intelligibility or knowability. No? It's shown, it's, there is a, an exhibition of this. Now, uh, in Plato, the proper place for paradigms is dialectics. And uh, for Plato and dialectics, uh, the paradigm ensures the, re the very relationship between the sensible and the intelligible. So let's now try to grasp uh, very quickly how paradigm functions in dialectics. One of the most uh, uh, difficult problem, a real crucial problem uh, in the interpretation of Plato's philosophy is the exposition of uh, the dialectical method in the sixth book of the Republic. So it's all just, just immediately before the description of the allegory of the cave, eh, there is this uh, famous passage which has been always considered as a very obscure and difficult problem. So my claim, eh, or my suggestion, is that this very difficult passage becomes clear or clearer if we read it as an exposition of the paradigmatic method. Here, Plato distinguishes two stages or two degrees in the production of science, which he describes as two segments on the same straight line. So he draws a line and divides two segments. The first segment defines the method of what he calls the geometer and the, the geometer and those who practice science of this kind, so mathematicians. Huh? This method, according to Plato, is founded on hypothesis or presupposition. Huh? Term hypothesis in Greek means literally presupposition. 